Leopold Mozart to Lorenz Hagenauer, Salzburg. Koblenz, September 26, 1763. Before leaving Mainz, I had to give another concert to the nobles, after which we came on to Koblenz. On the 19th and 20th, we had the most atrocious rain. The 21st was an ember day, on which I did not want to travel, but in order that we should not spend our time to no purpose, the few nobles who are here arranged a concert which was held on the 21st. It did not bring in much, but it was something, and I had no expenses in connection with it. One of the reasons why I did not leave here immediately on the 19th or 20th was that Wolfgang had a chill, which by the evening and the night of the 22nd had turned into a proper cold, so I am obliged to wait for a few days, especially as the weather is so bad. Thus we shall hardly leave before the 25th or 26th, for I must consider the health of my children before everything else. Here I met Baron von Waldorf and Kopp, a priest, who was formerly a steward and is now an ecclesiastical commissioner. Baron von Waldorf and Count von Pergen, imperial envoy, took my children by the hand to the elector and introduced us so that it is due to them that we were heard immediately on the 18th. We also received at once a present of ten louis d'or. We are a great deal with the family of the Baron Kirpen, who is electoral privy councillor and the head of the nobility. He has seven sons and two daughters, nearly all of whom play the clavier, and some of whom play the violin and the violoncello and sing. We also receive visits from Baron Hohenfield. What will you say when I tell you that since... We have left Salzburg, we have spent 1,068 gulden, but other people have paid for this expenditure. Besides, to keep our health and for the reputation of my court, we must travel noblemen. Moreover, we only associate with the nobility and distinguished personages and receive exceptional courtesies and respect. Leopold Mozart to Lorenz Hagenauer Salzburg, Brussels, October 17th, 1763. In Koblenz, we took a private boat, and leaving on September 27th at 10 in the morning, we reached Bonn, that same evening in good time. Thence we traveled by mail coach through Brühl to Cologne, where we arrived early in the evening of the 28th. We spent two days in that great old town, in the cathedral, there is a very ancient pulpit from which Martin Luther is supposed to have preached. On September 30th, we left Cologne by mail coach, traveling through Aachen. It was the most awful road. Now, as Aachen was the most expensive place which I had so far struck during our journey, I had the honor of spending over 75 gulden there. Princess Amelia sister of the king of prussia was there it is true but she herself has no money and her whole equipage and court retinue resembles a physician's suite as closely as one drop of water another if the kisses which she gave to my children and to wolfgang especially had been all new louis d'or we should be quite happy but neither the innkeeper nor the postmaster are paid in kisses the most ridiculous thing seemed to me that she tried by every means to persuade me to go not to Paris, but to Berlin, and what is more, she made to me proposals which I shall not write down here, as nobody would believe them, for I did not believe them myself, especially the particular one which she made to me. From Aachen we drove on October 2nd to Liege, where... We only arrived at nine in the evening. We left early next morning, at about half-past seven. It was the most lovely day, 
from Liege to Paris. Just think of the amazing distance. The post road is paved like the streets of a town and planted on either side with trees like a garden walk. We spent the night in Turlemont. On the following day, we reached Louvain early and spent the morning there in order to see the town a little. The principal church was the first building we visited. Here the valuable paintings of the famous Netherland painters begin. I stood transfixed before a last supper. On October 4th, we reached Brussels early in the evening. We are staying at the Hotel d'Angleterre. Quantities of white and black marble and brass and paintings of the most famous artists are to be found here in the churches in great numbers. Day and night, I have before my eyes the picture by Rubens and the big church in which Christ, in the presence of the other apostles, hands the keys to Peter. The figures are life-size. In Prince Karl's rooms, I found not only beautiful Dutch tapestries and paintings, but also a room with original Chinese statues, porcelain, figures, and various rare pieces. Above all, there was a room filled with an indescribable quantity of all kinds of natural history specimens. I have seen many such collections, but it would be difficult to find such a quantity in so many species. Prince Carl's present recreations are to lacquer, paint, varnish, eat, drink, and laugh heartily, so that he can be heard three or four rooms away. The rules of the church are still taken fairly seriously here. You can see at once that this is a country which belongs to Her Majesty the Empress. But rosaries are not usual, and in the churches you never see anybody praying with one. They all pray out of books, and at the elevation of the host they never strike their breasts. In all the churches no chairs are to be seen, but seats can be hired for a liard, in our coinage, two pennings. For you alone, Brussels, November 4th, 1763. We have now been kept in Brussels for nearly three weeks. Prince Karl has spoken to me himself and has said that he will hear my children in a few days, and yet nothing has happened. Yes, it looks as if nothing will come of it. The prince spends his time hunting, eating, and drinking, and in the end it appears that he has no money. Meanwhile, in decency, I have neither been able to leave nor to give a concert, since, as the prince himself has said, I must await his decision. You can imagine that I shall have, in addition, a pretty bill to pay at the hotel, and for the journey to Paris I must have at least two hundred golden in my pocket. I have now received here, it is true, various handsome presents, which, however, I do not want to sell. Little Wolfgang has been given two magnificent swords, one from Count von Frankenberg, Archbishop of Malines, and the other from General Count de Ferrarius. My little girl has received Dutch lace from the Archbishop and from other courtiers, cloaks, coats and so forth, with snuff boxes and etus and such stuff we shall soon be able to rig out a stall. Indeed, I hope that next Monday, when a big concert is being held, I shall haul in plenty of fat thalers and Louis Dior. But as one must always make oneself safe, I beg you to be so good as to arrange through Herr Hoffner or some other person that I receive another letter of credit for Paris. If Salzburg has been surprised at my children, it will be completely amazed when and if God lets us return home. Have you not yet received the portraits of my children? Leopold Mozart to Lorenz Hagenauer, Salzburg, Paris, December 8th, 1763. After giving a fine concert in Brussels, at which Prince Karl was present, we left at nine in the morning, on my worthy name day. 
with four post horses, and after taking leave early of many good friends, we reached Mons in the afternoon while it was still daylight. On the second day, we arrived just as early in Parion, and on the third day, Gournay. On the fourth, November 18th, at half past three in the afternoon, we arrived at the hotel of Count Van Eyck in Paris. Fortunately, we found the Count and the Countess at home. They gave us a most friendly welcome and have provided us with a room in which we are living comfortably and happily. We have the Countess's harpsichord because she does not need it. It is a good one and, like ours, has two manuals. You would like to know, perhaps, how I like Paris. If I were to tell you this in circumstantial detail, neither the height of a cow nor that of a rhinoceros would suffice. Buy yourself for 45 Kreutzer, Johann Peter Wilbrandt's History. It will amuse you. Tomorrow we must go to the Marquis de Villeroy and to Countess Lily Bonnet. The mourning for the Infanta still prevents us from playing at court. Leopold Mozart to Lorenz Hagenauer, Salzburg. Versailles, end of December, 1763. You may read the enclosed letter, make an extract of it, seal it up, and deliver it to our father confessor, with my most humble greetings and New Year's wishes. Or you may let him do the sealing himself. Madame de Pompadour is still a handsome woman. She is very like the late Frau Steiner, Neve Teresa Frasoff, and still rules over everything. And she has something of the appearance of the Austrian Empress, especially in her eyes. She is extremely haughty and still rules over everything. In Versailles, living is expensive, and it is very fortunate that at the present time it is almost as warm as in summer, for otherwise we should be hard put to it, as every log of wood costs five sous. Yesterday my boy got a gold snuff box from Madame la Comtesse de Tesse, and today my little girl was given a small transparent snuff box inlaid with gold from the Princess Carignan, and Wolfgang a pocket writing case in silver with silver pens with which to write his compositions. It is so small and exquisitely worked that it is impossible to describe it. My children have taken almost every one by storm, but everywhere the results of the late war are to be seen. It is impossible to write down all that one would like to describe. Wish all my good friends a happy new year. I should like to write to everybody if I had time and if every letter did not cost twenty or thirty sous. If I had written a longer letter to his grace, I should certainly have had to pay five liveries, for they charge according to the weight and the size or the shape. Did you send me an answer? Perhaps you did, and I shall find it at our hotel in Paris when we get back. Farewell. Adieu. Myself, my wife, and children send our greetings and wish you and your wife and your family a happy new year. Thank God. We are all well. You shall see Wolfgang in his black suit and French hat. Leopold Mozart to Christian von Meckel. Mon ami. January ninth, 1764. We arrived back from Versailles yesterday evening at half past eight. I called at your quarters today after one o'clock and tried both entrances. To prove this, I have written my name on your blackboard. We are hoping to see you soon. Farewell. My children send greetings to you. Mozart. I even walked to your place, a very wonderful thing for me. Leopold Mozart to Frau Maria Theresa Hagenauer, Paris, February 1st, 1764. Madame, one must not always write to men, but must sometimes remember the fair and pious sex. 
I really cannot tell you whether the women in Paris are fair, for they are painted so unnaturally like the dolls of Berchtesgaden that even a naturally beautiful woman on account of this detestable makeup is unbearable to the eyes of an honest German. As for piety, I can assure you that it is not difficult to get to the bottom of the miracles of the French women saints. The greatest of them are performed by those who are neither virgins, nor wives, nor widows, and they are all performed during their lifetime. Later on, we shall speak more fully on this subject. But really, it is extremely difficult to distinguish here who is the lady of the house. Everyone lives as he or she likes, and if God is not specially gracious, the French state will suffer the fate of the former Persian Empire. I received lately your husband's two letters of December 20th and January 19th, with the three enclosures. The most important, and certainly to you, the most pleasant piece of information I can give you is that, thank God, we are all well, and I too always look forward most eagerly to hearing that all of you are in good health. Since my last letter from Versailles, I would assuredly have written to you, only I kept on postponing this in order to await the result of our affair at Versailles and be able to tell you about it. But as everything here, even more so than at other courts, goes at a snail's pace, and since these matters have to be dealt with by the menus plaisirs, one must be patient. If the recognition we receive equals the pleasure which my children have given this court, we ought to do very well. I should like to tell you that it is not the custom here to kiss the hand of royal persons, or to disturb them a petition, or even to speak to them a passage, as they call it. That is to say, when they walk to church through the gallery, and the royal apartments. Neither is it the custom here to do homage either by an inclination of the head or a genuflection to the king or to members of the royal family. On the contrary, one remains erect and immovable, and standing thus, one just lets the king and his family pass close by. Hence you can well imagine how impressed and amazed these French people who are so infatuated with their court customs must have been when the king's daughters, not only in their apartments but in the public gallery, stopped when they saw my children, came up to them, and not only allowed them to kiss their hands, but kissed them innumerable times. And the same thing happened with Madame la Dauphine. But what appeared most extraordinary to these French people was that at the Grand Covert, on the evening of New Year's Day, not only was it necessary to make room for us all to go up to the royal table, but my Wolfgang was graciously privileged to stand beside the Queen the whole time, to talk constantly to her, entertain her, and kiss her hands repeatedly, besides partaking of the dishes which she handed him from the table. This queen speaks as good German as we do, and as the king knows none, she interpreted to him everything that our gallant Wolfgang said. I stood beside him, and on the other side of the king, where Madame Le Dauphin and Madame Adelaide were seated, stood my wife and daughter. Now you must know that the king never dines in public, except on Sunday evenings when the whole royal family dine together. But not everyone is allowed to be present. When, however, there is a great festival, such as New Year's Day, Easter, Whitsuntide, the Names Day, and so forth, the Grand Covert is held, to which all persons of distinction are admitted. There is not, however, very much room, and consequently the hall soon gets filled up. We arrived late, so the Swiss guards had to make way for us, and we were led through the hall into the room close to the royal table, through which the royal family enter. As they passed us, they spoke to our Wolfgang, 
and we then followed them to the table. You can hardly expect me to describe Versailles to you. I can only tell you that we arrived there on Christmas Eve and attended matins and three masses in the royal chapel. We were in the royal gallery when the king came from Madame la Dauphin, to whom he had been breaking the news which he had just received of the death of her brother, the elector of Saxony. I heard good and bad music there, Everything sung by individual voices and supposed to resemble an aria was empty, frozen, and wretched, in a word, French, but the choruses are good and even excellent. So every day I have been with my little man to the mass in the royal chapel to hear the choir and the motet, which is always performed there. The royal mass is at one o'clock, but if the king goes hunting, his mass is at ten o'clock, and the Queen's Mass at half-past twelve. I shall tell you more about all this later. In sixteen days we were obliged to spend about twelve Louis Dior in Versailles. Perhaps you think it too much and find it difficult to understand, but in Versailles there is no Carrosse de Remis and no Fiacre, only sedan chairs. Thus, for every drive, one has to pay twelve sous. So now you will see that, as on many days, for the weather was always bad, we had to have at least two, if not three, sedan chairs that came to one lopthaler and sometimes more. If you now add four new black suits, you will not be surprised if our visit to Versailles cost us twenty-six or... 27 Louis Dior. Well, we must see what we shall get from the court in return. Apart from what we hope to receive, we have not taken in at Versailles more than 12 Louis Dior. My master Wolfgang, however, has received from Madame la Comtesse de Tesse a gold snuff box and a gold watch, valuable on account of its smallness the size of which I have traced here. Nan Earl has been given an uncommonly beautiful heavy toothpick case of solid gold. From another lady, Wolfgang has received a traveling writing case in silver, and Nan Earl an unusually fine tortoise shell, snuff box inlaid with gold. Further, the number of our snuff boxes has been increased by a red one, with gold bands, by another in some sort of glass material set in gold, and by a third in Vernice Martin, inlaid with the most beautiful flowers of colored gold, and various pastoral instruments. In addition, we have received a small ring set in gold with an antique head, and a host of trifles, which I do not value very highly, such as sword bands, ribbons, and armlets flowers for caps, ficus for nanural, and so forth. But I hope, after four weeks, to have a better story to tell of Louis Dior, for it takes longer than to walk to Max Glen before one is properly known in Paris. And I assure you that it does not require a telescope to see everywhere the evil results of the late war, for the French insist on continuing their external magnificence and therefore only the fermiers are rich while the lords are deep in debt. The bulk of the country's wealth is divided amongst about a hundred persons, a few big banqueers and fermiers, generals, and finally most money is spent on lucretius who do not stab themselves. All the same, you can imagine that remarkably beautiful and precious things are to be seen here, and astonishing follies, too. In winter, the women wear not only fur-trimmed garments, but also neck ruffles or neckties of fur, and instead of flowers, even fur in their hair and fur marmalets and so forth. But the most ridiculous sight is the type of sword band, which is in fashion here, bound round and round with fine fur, 
an excellent idea for the sword will not catch cold. And in addition to their idiotic mode in all things, there is their extreme love of comfort, which has caused this nation to turn a deaf ear to the voice of nature. Hence, every one in Paris sends newborn children to be reared in the country. Persons of both high and low rank do this and pay a bagatelle for it. But you see the wretched consequences of this practice, for you will hardly find any other city with so many miserable and mutilated persons. You have only to spend a minute in a church or walk along a few streets to meet some blind or lame or limping or half-putrefied beggar or to find someone lying on the street who had his hand eaten away as a child by the pigs, or someone else who in childhood fell into the fire and had half an arm burnt off while the foster father and his family were working in the fields. And there are numbers of such people whom disgust makes me refrain from looking at when I pass them. Now I am going to jump from the ugly to the charming, and moreover to someone who has charmed a king. You surely would like to know what Madame la Marquise de Pompadour is like. She must have been very beautiful, for she is still good-looking. In figure, she is tall and stately, stout, or rather well-covered, but very well-proportioned. She is fair and extremely like our former Teresa Ferrisoff, while her eyes are rather like those of Her Majesty the Empress. She is extremely dignified and uncommonly intelligent. Her apartments at Versailles are like a paradise, and look out on the gardens. In Paris, she has a most splendid hotel, entirely rebuilt in the Faubourg St. Honoré, in the room where the clavecin is, which is all gilt and most artistically lacquered and painted, hangs a life-size portrait of herself and beside it a portrait of the king. Now for another matter. There is a perpetual war here between the Italian and the French music. The whole of French music is not worth a sow. But the French are now starting to make drastic changes, for they are beginning to waver very much, and in 10 to 15 years the present French taste, I hope, will have completely disappeared. The Germans are taking the lead in the publication of their compositions. Amongst these, Schaubert, Eckhart, Hanauer for the clavier, and Hochbrucker and Mayer for the harp are the favorites. M. Legrand, a French clavier player, has abandoned his own style completely, and his sonatas are now in our style. Schubert, Eckhart, Legrand, and Hochbrucker have all brought us their engraved sonatas and presented them to my children. At present, four sonatas of Wolfgang Mozart are being engraved. Picture to yourself the Führer which they will make in the world when people read on the title page that they have been composed by a seven-year-old child, and when the skeptics are challenged to test him, as he has already been, imagine the sensation when he asks someone to write down a minuet or some tune or other, and then immediately and without touching the clavier, writes in the bass, and, if it is wanted, the second violin part. In due course you will hear how fine these sonatas are. One of them has an adante, in a quite unusual style. Indeed, I can tell you, my dear Frau Hagenauer, that every day God performs fresh miracles through this child. By the time we reach home, God willing, he will be able to contribute to the court music. He frequently accompanies in public concerts. He even, when accompanying, transposes a prima vista, and everywhere Italian or French works are put before him, which he plays off at sight. My little girl plays the most difficult works, which we have of Schubert and Eckhart and others, 
Eckhart's being the most difficult with incredible precision and so excellently that this mean Schobert cannot conceal his envy and jealousy and is making himself a laughing stock to Eckhart, who is an honest man, and to many others. Later on I shall tell you many things which would take too long to relate here. Schobert is not at all the man he is said to be. He flatters to one's face and is utterly false, but his religion is the religion in fashion. May God convert him. Now I have a very sad piece of news, something extremely distressing. We are all in great anxiety and very much upset. In a word, Countess Van Eyck is a, in a most dangerous condition, so much so that without the special grace of God she will hardly live. On Sunday we were with her before lunch, between twelve and one, and she was very cheerful. She had then been indoors for a few days owing to a cold, but that day she had been to church. As always, she talked a great deal to Wolfgang. During the night I heard a carriage enter the courtyard, and then some disturbance in the house. In the morning I was told that the Countess had suddenly fallen ill, and had coughed up a quantity of blood. Imagine our distress, which is all the greater, as I can only look on from a distance, and may perhaps never speak to her or even see her again. My children pray and shed tears, as Wolfgang loves the Countess, and she loves him to distraction. I am writing this on the evening of February 1st. God grant that tomorrow morning, before I close this letter, I may be able to write more cheerfully. My wife can think of nothing else all day long but the poor Countess, and indeed we are deeply concerned. There is now little room left on the sheet of paper. I must add, however, that the Archbishop of Paris has been cast out into the wilderness, or, to put it mildly, has been exiled. He had a libelous pamphlet printed against the Parliament in favor of the Jesuits, which brought this punishment upon him. As far as I hear, everyone blames him for the king, who was informed that he was going to publish this piece of writing, tried in a friendly manner to dissuade him. However, he persisted and thus deliberately dashed his head against the wall. The king hastened to exile him. Otherwise, the parliament would have arrested him. The secular arm is a bit too powerful here. On the other hand, the clergy go about the streets singly, lower their cowls before their shoulders, hold their hats in their hands, and are absolutely indistinguishable from lay pedestrians. Farewell, and thank God that I have finished writing, otherwise you would indeed have to put on your spectacles. With greetings for myself, my children, and my wife, I am your devoted Mozart. How is our good Delmore? He, is he still in our neighborhood? He will sometimes think of us when he sees nobody at our windows. Please give him my compliments and greetings from us all, and especially from little Wolfgang. He is an honest man. 